All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for yet another student of the gun radio episode number 1191. No, it is not a requirement for me to say that. I just like to do it. Uh, proof. The Kung flu was made and released deliberately. Yes, I know. You're wondering. You're like, well, I mean, you know, I feel like it. I did like, no, no. We, we need to just move on and we need to, well, as we go, as we progress, I'm going to address the whole, uh, well, everyone just did the best they could with the information they had, and nobody really knew what was going on, and you can't fault people for blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to knock all that, all that crap out of the park. Uh, we're going to talk about some training. So now it's training season. It's not recruiting season anymore. It's training season. Uh, we're talking about long-term storage guns. We're going to talk about hardware, some pew pews, and then we'll do a real quick armed on the beach. Or, I'm not paranoid. I don't think I should take a gun to the beach. Okay, cool. Cool. Cool story, bro. I got uh, Jared with me. I got Zach with me. And uh, unless they've got something to say, we're going to go ahead and get this thing kicked off. Well, thanks for joining us today. That's all I've got to say before Zach plays the opening. Baba Booey. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drift ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up to your beloved host, the Pin Hand of America, Professor Paul Barkley. All right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. Just in case you guys uh, didn't get the memorandum, uh, we've got a high elevation precision rifle class coming up uh, July 28th to the 30th, the last weekend of July. That's the uh, the 101 class, and uh, if you have ever wanted to stretch out your skills and your rifle, if you ever want to learn how to dope wind, have you ever wanted to learn how to estimate range, uh, if you ever wanted to really truly learn how to work with the uh, your scope, you got adjustable knobs, external adjustable knobs on your scope, uh, all of that good stuff. You ever want to shoot? A thousand yards and be able to brag to your friends that you hit a target at a thousand yards. How about a mile? You want to be able to brag to your friends that you hit a target at a mile? Well, if you bring the appropriate gear and the uh, appropriate mindset, you can do all of those things at the high elevation precision rifle class. And this is a that's a once a year deal, and uh, it's a all inclusive. You you pay the tuition and you come out. You stay in a genuine Wyoming mountain lodge. You get your meals, you get your training, you get the, you get everything. So you just got to bring yourself and your gun. So, and the link, the linkage is in the show notes. And you check that out. Now, the other thing that we mentioned, we mentioned it about a week or two ago. I think we've been kind of talking about it for the last two weeks, uh, is a Patriot Fire Team training camp. This is team training. And, uh, we did, uh, a few years ago, well, we did it's a, a PFT leadership seminars. We did three leadership seminars. And then uh, uh, last year, we did a PFT training camp. We had a bunch of highly motivated people who came out and uh, had a great time. And we're going to say, well, what's it all about? Well, we're, we're going to do some firearms training. We're going to do that. But it's not just firearms training. We're going to have land navigation communication, signaling, team tactics, patrolling, uh, how to work to get, how to work with other people. And of course, you're going to spend some time with like-minded individuals, which is always a good thing. Uh, believe you me, it is time well spent. Now, the, the high elevation precision rifle class is going to be in Encampment, Wyoming. It's not actually going to be in town. It's going to be out in the country, but the closest town is Encampment. And uh, the PFT training camp is going to be in Vernal, Utah. And this is when I say it's not going to really be in town. <laughs> but that's the closest town to it. 
It's going to be outside of town, out in the mountains, in the glorious, beautiful winter mountain part of the uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and you're going to want to do that. So, And that one is the training camp is coming up in about a month. So it's June 30th to July 2nd. You've got the time. It's within driving distance. Sign up. Get your butt here. If you have a a a, uh, a buddy or kids or whatever, now not little kids, but teenagers are fine. We we've had people bring their sons. We had multiple mm-hmm. people bring their sons to training camps and stuff, and and it's it's perfectly fine. So there you go. So those are in the show notes. I expect to see some of you freaks here, and uh, like I said. Now is the time. Now is the time. All right, Zach, are we uh, are we live on the Discord? Yes, indeed. We are live on the Discord. All right, so that means if you guys have questions, if you Discordians have questions, post them, and the boys will pay attention. I promise you they will. Right? I think <laughs> we like that you. I will, I will, I will see if you have a question. If you're yeah, extremely true. nice to us, we'll do that. Yeah. Oh, and the one other thing I wanted to uh, acknowledge, because I haven't acknowledged it publicly yet, uh, is the uh, Charlie riding shotgun with Charlie. If you don't know what that is or who that is. uh, um, Now you do. Charlie with Charlie, Charlie, Charlie's last name is Charlie Cook. Charlie Cook. That's right. Super simple. Duh. Uh, So Charlie Cook has a little, little YouTube show. Uh, called Riding Shotgun with Charlie, and he basically he kidnaps firearms industry celebrities for about an hour, and he makes them talk. Lovely <laughs> drive around. So, yeah, he kidnapped me for about an hour uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, and we recorded uh, a show, and that show is available now on YouTube. And actually, he he does have a podcast show. Um. So it's a, if you're looking for a little bonus, Professor Paul, if you're looking for a Professor Paul bonus, uh, then you can, uh, yeah, you can uh, listen to that. The link's in there. The link's in there. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was cool of him to do that, so just go ahead and support him. All right, and maybe in the future, we, maybe in the future, if, we, if, we, if I'm on vacation or something, we can just grab that audio and, and stick we'll, it in there. We'll ask Charlie. We'll grab that audio, and I'm sure he'll say yes. No, I don't want the free publicity. Mm-hmm. I don't want the promo. Don't do that. All right. Uh, the review of the week. So we. Uh, where is it? Like, I got it right here. Yeah. All right. It's That's this right. week's student of the gun review of the week. Yeah, this week it is keeping in line with the classes that we just talked about. This one's from Tim Hamp, and it is a review directly related to high elevation precision rifle. He says, I was so pleased to be able to have the opportunity to take this class. I was able to be with like-minded individuals from different walks of life and areas of the country in a most beautiful region of the country. That was in Carbon County, Wyoming. The instruction included the basics to the advanced specifics. Professor Paul presented each important bit of instruction clearly and in such a wonderful, understandable way. Proper body position, correct trigger pull mechanics and follow through, and also how to figure out scope dope. It has taken me, and this is kind of in parentheses here, he says, it's taken me two months to review and absorb all of the magnificent information given during the two-day class. The first time I hit a thousand yards, 18 by 24 inch target, I thought it was great. Then hitting the target for a second time and a third and a fourth and a fifth time sent my spirit, mind and being into the stratosphere. I learned how to work my 308 model 700, a dream come true. The lodging was wonderful. The chef's meals were always great. Thank you to all involved at SOTG that made this possible. Well, you're welcome, Tim. And thank you very much for the glowing review. We appreciate it. There you go. And that's not the only one. If you don't believe us, you're like, I don't believe you, Paul. I don't, there's, there are many, 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 many reviews from your peers uh, that you can read. So. You can go read them yourself. You go to SOTGU.com. Click on the blue button that says reserve your class seat. Now, if you're colorblind, it might, be blue. It might not be blue for you, but it'll stay, still say reserve your class seat. 
So yep. go there, sotgu.com, and click that button, and you can go read those reviews. Yes, indeed, you can and should do that. All right, uh, I've got a, a good example of why you can, or well, you should, Duracoat your firearms. Yeah, I believe should is the right word there. You should dirt coat all your firearms. But yeah, in this yeah, particular I mean, situation. Yeah, you're an American. You can. You can do whatever you want, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna stop you. But uh, this this last weekend, Zach came up uh to the mountains and we were hanging out and we did a bunch of filming. And one of the things we did, I was as I'm gonna give you guys a little teaser. Um I was on the on the uh, radio with my good buddy Bill Frady last week. If you guys didn't catch that, well, it's out there. And uh, he asked me, he, we were, he said, uh, he, he said, he actually brought up John Farnham. He said, I was talking to John and I asked him, I said, John, do you have a plate carrier? And he said, no. Uh, he goes, well, how do you carry like extra stuff and stuff for your rifle? He said, I got a bandolier. It's just, and, and uh, Bill's like, I don't know what kind of bandolier. And I said, just get a sling bag. A, a bag with a big one single strap and put all your crap in there. Um, and it reminded me of the, uh, of the, the bag review that we did way back when we were in the glass case of emotion. That's when that happened. Remember when we, when we got the call from Shane and he's like, Hey bro, I got a confession to make. That was glass case of emotion. That's how long ago that's been. My gosh. Time yeah. flies. So essentially, uh, I, we did a little video and I call it the, I call it the late for school bag because that's, that's what happened. They were late for school and he's like, Oh crap, come on, let's go. Come on. And it was Texas was on the show or was that on a video? The, the late for school bag? Yeah. Oh dude. I don't know. I mean, that was, we did that. We, well, I'm Joe, I know we discussed it. Uh, we discussed it back when we were in the glass case for motion studio. Uh but essentially, long story short is uh, there, may, there are going to be times in your life where you're, you're in a hurry. You're like, oh, crap, we got to go. Let's come on. And you're, maybe it's hot. It's summertime. You're in shorts, flip-flops, T-shirt, whatever. And, or maybe it's not, and you just, like, you're just thinking, uh, I'm just going to run to the store. I'm just going to go get blank. I, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm not going to take the time to put all my stuff on. Well, that's exactly when you're going to need it is when you decide you don't need it. That's when you're going to need it. And so we came up with an idea. It's like, what you know, uh, take get one of these sling bags, and there's lots of them out there. Lots of people make them. Uh, and put the fundamental four in the bag and stage it and leave it alone. Don't take stuff in and out of it, you know. Uh, and this is when you have to, you know, put a gun and I was sucking a bill. And I said, I said come on, you're, we're Americans. Everybody has more than one handgun, right? If you only have one, okay. But gun culture people have more than one. Well, the reason I'm talking about this for Duracoat is because uh, Zach and I sh shot a little some video, and I went and got that bag. I got the late for school bag, right? And it's been yeah, we, there is a gun staged. Yeah, not in a Z core bag. No, it wasn't. And in also not Duracoated, or it was Duracoated. Oh, when was this? No, I mean, I'm asking about the gun that was in the bag. Oh, no, no. So in the bag, yeah. So uh, I actually, truth be told, I forgot which gun specifically was in there. I knew it was a Canic, right? I knew it was a Canic. It was the SA, wasn't it? Uh, oh, no, it's, no, it's, it's the, uh, the SF Elite. S uh, yeah, okay. Yep. So uh, I said to Zach, all right, let's do this. And I unzipped it, reached in, pulled it out. And I'm like, ha, there you are. Uh, and it was loaded up and ready to go. Uh, and I had Duracoated that gun a few years ago. Uh, I don't know how many years ago it was. It was a couple of years ago. And uh, you say, well, big deal, Paul. Congratulations to you. No, well, the reason it's important is because if you're going to do something along those lines where you're just going to put it away, it's going to be ready to go in an emergency just in case. Well, you don't want it to rust or corrode do you you're like no i don't well there you go 
Uh, and I know we always talk about colors. We always talk about cool colors, greens and, you know, blacks and blues and oranges and reds and whatever. You know, we always talk about cool colors, but really the, the primary number one purpose of Duracoat is not to be a cool color. It's to protect the metal against corrosion. That is the a, you know, durable coating, Duracoat. That's it. It's to make it rust resistant. And it was, well, I mean, I shouldn't have to tell you, but it was, you know, I was very pleased to pull that gun out after having literally been in there for well, I don't think I've opened that bag because I, I knew what I did. I staged it. I've got a knife, a flashlight, a, a uh, pocket lifesaver kit, an extra tourniquet, and a gun in that bag ready to go. I can just grab it and run. If I was naked, I could grab that bag and run out and have the fundamental four, right? You should uh, put some underwear in there too. Yeah, put some underwear in there. But yeah, if I if I jumped out of the shower naked and had to had to go, I could grab that thing and at very least I would have the fundamental four on me, right? So yeah, the the gun's spotless. It, it's it it is. I mean, it, it looks like new. It's spotless. Uh, you know, we and we did a video that's going to be coming up very soon. But yeah, that. That's the reason. If you're going to put guns in a safe, if you're going to put guns in a closet, if you're going to stage them, if whatever, you, you, if you needed no other reason, that's the reason. You know, you don't want to have to worry. Hey, when I get this thing out to use it, is it going to be messed up? You know. Um, so there you go. Uh, and it was, and, and the gun is done in slightly darker black. <laughs> Oh if, yeah! If you don't have this, the st- official student of the gun, slightly darker black. You can get that. You're like he's joking, right? There's not actually a slightly darker black. Oh, I'm not kidding. I'm not joking. This is real. <laughs> get your butt over to Duracoat Firearm Finishes and get yourself some slightly darker black. Yes, indeed. Slightly dark black. All right. Um, hey, you know what? I just saw I got a notification. And it was a, uh, a YouTube notification. And uh, you know that super tall giant dude who goes by the name Hickok45? E. Yep. Uh, I've met him. I can't remember what Hickok's actual name is. It's not Hickok, but he's good buddies with Marty. Uh, Marty you know, um, knows him. Uh, our buddy talking lead. But the reason I bring it up is because he just tested and reviewed the 10 millimeter high point. No way. Yeah. Yeah. And this is when you say you guys out in the studio, the gun eye, it's like, dude, didn't you do that? Like three or four years ago? I'm like, yeah, I did, but, but it's cool. I mean, I'm sure he's got a list of stuff and he's working his way down the list. Um, but, uh, I thought that was interesting. I thought that was interesting. We we've actually done a couple of them. We ours has limbs on it. <laughs> I I love that. That's so awesome. Our our ten mil. I think. Well, I I think. I was like, I was going to say, I think I'm the only one that has a ten millimeter bowcaster. Uh, I, I feel like that that's a safe assumption. <laughs> 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 I feel like that that is a safe assumption. Um. If you don't know what we're talking about, uh, uh, okay. that happen? oh, no, no, no. I put up, I put 10 millimeter high point bowcaster mm-hmm. and uh, guns.com had put up a, uh, a review and I clicked the hyperlink and it said not available. Oh, like, oh. But if, if you do, if you put in uh, High Point Bowcaster, uh, there are several hits or, or, or oh, returns. Some hits? There's some returns. How many hits you got on that site there, buddy? Uh, there are some returns. There, there's still uh, a bunch of Facebook posts. Remember when we took it to the, which NRA was it? Which NRA show Oh man, twenty eight. Was it Nashville? Was it Nashville or or was it was it Dallas? I think it was Dallas. Gosh. 
Yeah, I yes. can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was Dallas. Yeah. So it was on display. Uh, it was on display at the uh, in the High Point booth at the Dallas NRA show. Uh, so that's it's a fa- that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. It's so cool. It's so sexy. There's pictures of it out in the snow, and uh, yeah, yeah. There you go. So that's the thing. Yeah, that's the thing that we did. We did that thing. <laughs> and 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 uh, oh, some people took took photos uh, of themselves holding it at the Dallas uh, show and, and shared them on socialist media and stuff. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, there you go. There you go. Congratulations to to uh, Hickok 45 for getting around to reviewing the 10 millimeter high point 10 millimeter carbine. And if you guys haven't seen the, uh, the 10 millimeter carbine uh, video yet, uh, Zach, you put, you put that, the, the Hoth report as like a whole entire. Yeah. Uh, you, you, the full series. We, we, yeah. We did the whole full series as just as one video. So if you guys yeah. haven't, had the opportunity to to catch it lately or ever or whatever, uh, you can do that. That would be cool. It's not that long. It's it's kind of fun. And you know, Zach and I went out up into the, the frozen mountains and froze our asses off to to make that thing for you. So the the least you can do is watch it from the warmth of your home. <laughs> and it the full series is on the student of the gun Juxy channel i would be remiss if i didn't remind you of that and i don't want to be remiss so uh yeah the the entire uh the entire series together the hoth report which includes the 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 bowcaster uh it's there it's it's on the Juxy channel if you'd like to watch it, you can. You're hereby invited. You're cordially invited to watch that. How's that sound? Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. All right. And when you go to Duracoat Firearm Finishes, tell them the student of the gun set you. All right. It's time for me to be quiet and you, yes, you, to listen a little bit louder. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, he do. So uh, <laughs> we are going to go right now to where we're going to go. Well, I think we should go to our Brownells bullet points brought to you by our friends at Brownells. Yes, bing, bang, boom, boom. And what do we always, what do we generally talk about? Or what do what, we like to talk about hardware during the bullet points, right? We talk about hardware. We talk about stuff. We talk about guns and stuff. And I hope that you guys took advantage of the, uh, this last weekend's Brownells Memorial Day sale because that's what they did. They did a Memorial Day sale this last weekend. And I have no idea if it's still going, um, but if it's if it's not, it's your fault. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what I did see. I noticed that uh, that practice ammo is is creeping down ever so slightly. Uh, it's not to back to twenty nineteen prices. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but it's creeping down into the twenties, like. Nine millimeter full metal jacket. I've seen it creeping down into the twenty five cents a shot range for uh, for brass cased ammo. That's, I see it creeping down there into that range. Uh, 
we said you know before the the buy price was 20 cents or under less than 20 cents a shot for nine mil training buy less than 30 cents a shot for five five six training buy uh the five five six i'm seeing it falling down into the 40s now it's better than it was during the the great pandemic insanity it was going for like a buck a shot 1999 for 20 rounds of ball ammo i don't think so not for freaking 22 uh or 223 that is but let's Let's talk about hardware, hardware. So uh, one of the things that uh, we did this last weekend, Zach came over, and uh, I finally, Adam, after promising me I'd get to review this at SHOT Show, uh, well, you know, things take time. They got to put guns on trucks and ship them across the country, you know. (laughs) And sometimes people need to be reminded. uh, But uh, we finally got our hands on the Mate mc9 and uh, that comes from from canic usa and uh if you guys are not familiar with the canic firearms line well i don't know what you i guess your head is like been firmly ensconced up your rectum or something because <laughs> it's been, because we've been talking about it uh for years now literally years and uh about two years ago we got our hands on the the full-size mete m-e-t-e uh products and the what the sf what was it the sxt or the sft uh the mete series so i reviewed uh the yeah the sft and the sfx i reviewed those and we actually did a uh essentially what amounted to a torture test on the sft we took it out we we dropped it in the sand we dropped it on hard rock and uh, we dropped it in a bucket of water and i shot it and shot it 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 it, and i shot it some more and then i shot a little bit more and thousand plus rounds into it 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 was rock solid rock solid uh and the interesting thing about the the mete the mate series is what they did is they took lessons over the last few years um people said yeah i like your pistols but i wish it had this or i wish you'd change this or i wish if you did this one thing it would be better and if you closely examine it that's ex- exactly what they did they made really small improvements over time uh to the gun well the the latest and greatest uh release from them is the mc9 it is a i, I guess you would call it a subcompact pistol if the if the the uh the sf elite if the sf elite is a compact pistol then the the uh, mc9 would be a subcompact pistol but don't let that fool you the crazy thing about this gun is well it's a nine millimeter and jared did you see the picture or did i not send it to you i Um, didn't see it Oh, okay. Yeah, I I didn't send it to you. I took the picture, but I didn't send it out yet. So Zach had his Glock 43 with him at the range. And he shot it. And I laid it down on top of the MC9. And they're almost identical. They're within a quarter of an inch plus minus of being the same size slide wise and frame height wise and width wise. Right? So imagine you're like okay well what how, how how can you compare this mc9 imagine it being about the same size as a glock 43 okay now now that you've got that in your mind now that you got that in your mind brain um let me give you let me tell you some specs it comes with two magazines one that holds 12 rounds of nine millimeter ammunition and another one that sticks out of the bottom about an uh, three quarters of an inch or an inch uh so that holds 15. this is when you said squeeze me baking powder squeeze me baking powder did you just say that the mc9 has a 15 round nine millimeter magazine yes i did uh the gun weighs 21 ounces empty 
and it's got a polymer frame. It's got the the trigger is a striker fired trigger, and the Canic pistols are famous for their good triggers. They're out of the box good triggers. Even even haters can't bag on the trigger. Even people who are just thoroughly you know up their own at butts up their own butts um, can't honestly bag on the trigger. They can't. It comes in a kit. It comes with a holster, which is actually, uh, I did something that I don't normally do, Jared. I actually took the holster that came with the gun. Usually when a gun comes with a holster, I'm like, eh, okay, that's nice. I throw it in a Tupperware box and it becomes a dog chew toy or something. But uh, uh, no, I put it on. I put it on um, and tucked it into my waistband and cinched it down and I used it and it worked fine was actually a usable holster a lot for a while now these guns that come from turkey that have been coming with holsters generally the holsters they come with are well it's better than throwing the gun on the ground it's it's actually a burrito holder but they market it as a holster oh like you could store burritos in it and then just like whip them out when you're hungry but i don't (laughs) recommend putting guns in most of those yeah most of most of the you know five six seven years ago ten years ago uh, when they came, when they're like, "Oh, let's let's ship a holster with it," and you got the holster out, and you're like, "Oh, that technically, you know, the the that is the 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 dictionary definition of a holster. Uh, it's a place to put your gun rather than like setting it down on the ground. But other than that, I wouldn't wear it. You know, this is actually a good holster. It actually works. Oh." Uh, and it comes with it comes with replaceable back straps, which is overkill on I think it's overkill, but it does cost them nothing, so whatever. A cleaning kit and uh you can change the magazine base out uh on the little mag. Uh the little mag has a super short flat base, or you can put a little finger hooky, finger ledge base on it. Uh, shot the gun. Uh now I, I only had it long enough to uh to do a couple hundred rounds out of it but let's face facts i wasn't expecting any problems or issues i would have been shocked if there was a problem ah, that's why there weren't any because of that cognitive bias yeah yeah, yeah there to be like, no issues yeah no and, but and are I, they accurate i mean is that thing even accurate well i don't know zach i shot the first two rounds from 10 yards into the same hole correct we, we have literal footage of this so we have footage no, of his answer of the first two rounds out of the gun going through the same hole. That's pretty good. So first two ever. Yeah. And, and what's, what's, but here's the crazy thing. If you know anything about, um, it's a lot of semi autos, generally the round that you chamber by hand will, will strike in a different place than the successive ones that are chambered by the, the inertia of the firing of the gun. But uh, I, the first, well, the first rounds I fired were Black Hills Honey Badger ammo. I started out the test by loading Black Hills Honey Badger into it's 115 grain Honey Badger, loaded it into the gun. Supersonic, subsonic. Yep, the super, the new super. stuff. The super. super. Thanks for asking. And uh, fired one round, took my time. I mean, I took my time. I wasn't rushing. And I fired the next <laughs> round, uh, and uh, it went through the same hole. And uh, then we, we, well, we got on it. And, and I, I had the variety pack of ammo. I had the ammo can with a whole crap ton of different. It's our diversity stuff. shoot. Yeah, the diversity stuff. Um, that reminds me. I was trying to get Tony to come on and talk about his diversity shoot, but we, we, we talked at Shot Show and then got lost. So I need oh, to follow okay. up with him. I'm going to do that right meow. Well, there you go. Do that right meow. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, oh, no, I lied. It's not 115. It's 100 grain. So the supersonic honey badger is 100, and the subsonic is 125. So if you want to shoot sub, it's 125. If you want to shoot super, thanks for asking. You want to see some good trigger discipline? Yes. Uh, it's blurry. It? It's oh, super blurry. That sucks. It's super blurry. Is It'll come out in the video. It's, it's your bit. You know, my favorite thing. Yeah. My favorite thing in that package was the Eliana pistol. 
Oh, the little tiny. It's a, it's a, oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a, like little, a little, little screwdriver. Tiny. Yeah. So what they, what they did a few years ago, uh, is so they cool. came out with these, uh, it's a screwdriver set that looks like a little baby pistol. looks like a little tiny pistol. And in the butt, in the magazine, what would be the magazine con- compartment, uh, magazine area, they put the, the screws and the bits and stuff like that. They're, they're in there. And the reason they do that is because if, if everything I talked about on the MC9 wasn't enough, it's also an optic-ready gun. You can uh-huh. remove the plate and put a red dot on it. So oh, that's cool. It's crazy. You know, I, I'm pretty jaded when it comes to firearms. Oh yeah, um, me too. Just because of you know d- Paul being my dad, and I don't get excited to shoot like new stuff very often. I mean, I I, I get excited, but not like, oh, I actually want to want to go do this by myself. Usually, we'll make it a, a family day at the range with dad and I, and Zach comes sometimes too. But usually, I'll wait for that opportunity to uh, to shoot a new gun. But I was I was fingering this thing um, before you did your review of it, and yeah. I was like, "Man, this the, the, like just out of the box. This thing's really cool." And so I'm excited to actually take it down to the range here and uh, get some rounds through it. Yeah. Now I'm looking in the description. Uh, it's optic ready, right? Uh, and in the description on the website, it doesn't say the footprint. Now, I believe, don't hold me to this, but I believe that the footprint is going to be the the shield footprint. Uh, that would make sense, but I'm not sure. I'm not positive. So, But there's this thing called the Internet. If you really want to know that badly, just look it up. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, yeah, the Brownells bullet points for this week is, uh, uh, well, I'm going to tell you that uh, we did some hardware and that the the review, the video review of that is going to be coming up very soon. And it's uh, kind of amazing. Kind of amazing. The, the Internet says that the Mete MC9 uses a modified RMSC footprint. Oh, Okay. So R- if the internet M- is to be believed, then that is that is what it is. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so RMSC Reflex Mini Sight Compact, which is the Shield Mini Sight Compact. Yep. So yeah, that would make total sense. Yes. And uh, the uh, I know that those there's, turkeys. There's, I was go just ahead. gonna say there's so many darn acronyms nowadays. Oh, I know. Got to be cool, man. <laughs> and I'm, I feel positive that the, uh, oh, here you go. If you go to internet.com, you can find a Canic Mechanic M-O, M01 Mini Red Dot Shield Footprint Red Dot Optic. Nice. There you go. And the Hollow so, work really well for their uh, those yeah. the RMS. And then Hollow Sun makes the profiles, the ones with the with the with the shield footprint. So there you go. If that is something that is important to you, uh, and one of the things that they did do, and, and this is the last thing I'll say about it for sites, is they put a front sight that just has a white dot, and the rear sight that is black with serrations and no dot and no paint. So that was I, I'm going to give them a two thumbs up for making that decision and not being R tards and like a lot of companies and putting white dots in the rear of a site. All right, Zach shipping ogre. Howdy. Is, is the store full? The store is full of amazing stuff that you can get over at shop. Uh, it's got, we actually just got a new to us book. That is the one second. Had to cough real quick. <clears throat> the Patriot Fire Team Operation Guide Book. If you have not checked that out or seen that yet, it is the full compilation of the entire Patriot Fire Team series, all smushed into one very convenient book. Get yourself a copy right now. Sorry, get yourself a copy right now. Get a pip hand approved. And yeah, shop SOTG.com is right on the front page. Yeah. Woo! I was going to give you the, that was my lead in to have you play that little video. Oh, 
<laughs> it's like Show you, notes. It sounded like you were pitching to the pitch, but I'll play the video too if you want, or we can just. Well, well you can do whatever you want. You're an adult. You're right. I'm the producer, so I'll, I'll do it anyway. You're the producer. Right. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the Pimp Hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, and the one thing I'm going to add to that, uh, well, you tell me if there's any left in stock. The Four Pillars of Fighting by James Yeager, edited by Paul Markle. Is that... We do, uh, we do still have those in stock, and you can get over at shopsotg.com. So, yeah. There you go. You can get that from us, and I, I think you should. If you haven't gotten that book yet, uh, you're wrong. You need to get it. So, there you go. All right. It's time for a student of the gun homeroom, and we're going to talk about being, well, what do we always, what's the theme of the homeroom? Dangerous on demand. EOD. EOD. Yes, Dangerous by Madison Rising. So, uh, <laughs> what did Ron Burgundy say? What did he tell them to do in San Diego? I think we know. Well, I mean, what We're was not he allowed was, to say it on the public? What did he want to do? I mean, what? No, he said, "Stay classy, San Diego." That's right. Let's stay classy, San Diego. Well, uh, stay classy, Chicago. Chicago, the classiest city in America. They're so classy. Oh, they are. So what just happened on Memorial Day weekend in Chicago, Jared? Oh, it's Gunfire Force's popular Chicago beach to close hours after opening for holiday weekend. Oh, so classy. A fight and a gunshot forced one of Chicago's most popular summer spots to close just hours after opening for Memorial Day weekend. Up to 100 teenagers gathered at the North avenue beach around 1 30 p.m on friday when a fight broke out and someone fired a gun video of the incident showed the group of teens taunting each other before a single gunshot is heard and the crowd disperses and there's a lot to unpack with just that information oh there. man like uh, yeah you remember when you were a teenager back and, in my and day to, us you, teenagers would have never done something like that well no, actually, remember w- w- when I was a teenager, their biggest worry or concern was teenagers drinking, you know, or they were yeah. you know, teenagers drinking and they're like, we got to make sure the teens aren't drinking. And, and, and here we're in, we're in Chicago and they're shooting at each other. Yeah. Stay classy. Oh, wow. It's so the there's gun's a fault. Yeah. If it wasn't for that gun, it wasn't for the gun, that wouldn't have happened. Like, how about a oh, lack of <laughs> yeah, so much stuff? I don't want to get into there's it. so yeah, much. But now yeah, people uh, would say to you, I don't need you think you should have a gun everywhere you go. And like, I'm not paranoid like you. Cool. Then don't carry right. a gun. Yep, you're not paranoid like me because you're not going to need a gun when you take your family to the beach, right? No, of course not. Why? Why would? Why would you think that would be a thing? I don't know. Maybe because we've got a a, a bunch of animals behaving like animals, uh, and but why would that be, Jared? How did this happen? How did Chicago? I thought they had all kinds of great ideas in Chicago about socialism and fairness and equity. And remember uh, 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 Gary, the enforcer, the former superintendent of the Chicago PD that, that blamed all of the gang violence and gun violence. It's like all this gang violence is because guns and because people in Indiana have guns. Like, how about we talk about the destruction of the nuclear family? I think that's probably more of a cause than, the existence of a tool, the rampant immorality, the and that's complete one thing I was total lack of morality. This issue isn't specific to Chicago. 
because it's happened other it's happened elsewhere not specifically on a chicago beach but it's happened in other cities as well there's uh, one it, instance that happened here in salt lake city where there were teenage gang members that got in a gunfight like oh. that well there, there's a whole lot of underlying yeah, issues you, there that it, and what, what you said is right is city city yeah you, so you, what, you pile people on top of each other and and like it this, seems to be like, what's the threshold? I've always wondered that. Okay, this not grand always, experiment in thinking, piling like, people on top yeah, of each other. What's the threshold? Is the threshold fifty thousand people? Is the threshold twenty thousand people? What does that seem to be before things well, start going downhill? Well, I, I think I think that the number is coming down uh, because what we've done is, is we've. Um, We've become tolerant towards bad behavior. We've made excuses for bad behavior. We don't punish bad behavior anymore. We certainly can't punish bad behavior. Uh, we can't. We can't hold people responsible for their behavior. There can't be consequences for behavior. We've removed consequences from behavior. Now, in this story, it says that they nabbed a fifteen-year-old. Yeah, I'm waiting for Chuck Schumer and uh, them to go out and tell me how this 15 year old went into a gun store and filled out the form and bought the gun. Like, well, obviously well, yeah, that's not if, the case, Paul. If somebody from Indiana wouldn't have brought it into Chicago, yeah. If people in Indiana in didn't buy and, guns, yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't happen. We need more gun control laws so 15-year-olds won't end up with guns. Uh, can, can we be honest with ourselves for just a, a second? This 15-year-old will never see the inside of jail. I mean, they, they'll throw him into a juvenile correction thing, and he'll be in the system until the system's bored with him or whatever, and he'll be right back out on the street. Because we don't hold people responsible for their behavior. You know, this is probably a good discussion to bring um, our buddy Jeff Kirkham in on. But my question is, how do you, once once a 15-year-old gets to this point in their life where they make this kind of decision, it's obviously a bad decision. How do you fix that? How do you heal the the mental uh, or the, the, the brain trauma, I guess you'll call it? Um, how do you heal that? Because uh, there's so many different things that go into it, like bad nutrition that affects the brain, the seed oils that are inflaming the body, all of these different things. And then obviously the the actions, the also, cultural, right? The cultural actions. This but this 15 year old lives you, in a culture that does not that doesn't look down upon this behavior. So do you um, start by helping the the parents in the culture or do you start by helping the kids and then hopefully in the next generation or two generations. Ah, that's a great, that's a great question. So how do you quote unquote help? Do you create a government program? That's what we need is more government programs because if you have more government programs, which is, you know, funded by taxpayers, uh, we need to create more government programs to, to stop that. Well, we've been doing it, government yeah. programs in New York, in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, in Detroit, and we've been doing government sponsored programs for decades. And and it hasn't gotten better, it's gotten worse. The the crazy thing to me is like if you compare this with somebody else we know who runs a um a fairly successful trauma healing, I guess it's called a retreat for mm -hmm. kids. And the way that they run that is, um, I, I don't know if they can do it in the United States because of the, the local laws. It might be just be a state thing, mm -hmm. but they've, they've had to seek, um, shelter elsewhere outside of this country because they can't do the thing that they know that actually helps the kids. Mm -hmm. But then you, you juxtapose that with a government program that is literally enslaving kids for generations. No, oh, yeah, this, well, let, let's go back to the, the old fashioned holding human beings responsible for their behavior. Holding 
consequences for actions. You see, socialism, and you guys should know this, but I'm going to say it again because apparently not everyone does. The poison of socialism is, is it says that people aren't to be held responsible for their own behavior. They're, it's a system that is to blame. It is a system that caused it, not the person, not the individual. The, this 15-year-old, he is not responsible for getting a hold of a, an illegal stolen gun and shooting it into a crowd of kids. It's not his fault. It's the system that failed him. But what they'll never bring up is they'll say, well, who's in charge of the system? Well, what do you mean, Paul? What are you talking about? Like, who is in charge of the system that failed him? Uh, the, the people. No, it's the government. You see, the, the solution to a failed government system, according to the other side, is more government. That's the solution. The solution is more government and more programs and more theft of tax money. More fraud, waste, deceit, fraud, and waste. That's what we need. No. What we need is families. What we need is churches. But you see, the socialist system has set about for 50 plus years, going back to the 60s, so now we're going 60 plus years, to destroy the family and destroy the church, to co opt the church so that it's unrecognizable. We're in a position where we've deliberately, we've allowed government to deliberately undermine the families in big cities. They replaced fathers with welfare checks. Don't tell me they didn't. They did it on purpose. They deliberately replaced fathers with welfare checks. Because if you rely on your father and your mother, you don't need the government. But if you rely on the government for a check, well, you learn to worship money. You destroy the family. Marx knew. He's like, there's no way for the state to have ultimate control over the people as long as the people have solid, reliable families and a church body. If they have faith in something other than a government, if they have faith in their God, if they get together and support each other, if they look to God first and government second, government can never have control. So the government set about, not, and all over the country, we're just, you know, and we're no exception. You're like, no, Paul, America has churches. Yeah, okay, congratulations. This crap that's going on in Chicago, this crap that's going on in New York, look at New York. We're going to talk about New York during the grad program where I can say squares because I don't think I can talk about that without saying squares. I mean, I could if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Are you paranoid? Do you take your gun to the beach? I take my gun to the beach. You know, you could take to the beach. You could take your late first. If you're in, in, in swim trunks and a tank top and flip flops, you can still be dangerous on demand. Just grab your late for school bag. You're like, yeah, but it's black and tactical. Well, don't get a black tactical one, Artard. Get one that's that's flowery or or blue or purple or whatever. You use some urban camouflage. There you go. There you go. All right, that is that's it. That is our uh, homeroom for the day. Now we're going to get into C. I told you so. We were right all along, going back to March of 2020, April of 2020, May of 2020, the summer of 2020, all through 2021 and 22. We were right. I said that there's no way in the world that this pandemic, that this this Kung flu, that this coronavirus just happened by mistake. There's no way. 
There is no way that you have a Wuhan Institute of Virology where they're developing biological weapons and the Kung flu just accidentally comes out of there. No possible way. However, the sycophants, the whores in the American media, the sycophants and the whores at Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, you name it, they're, they're whores. They're bought and paid for by big government. They're bought and paid for by Big Pharma, by Pfizer. Well, recently, a gentleman, and uh, the gentleman's name is, let me go to my show. David Martin. David Martin, the founder and chairman of MCAM Asset Management Company, an international COVID sub. He's a patent auditing expert. So he's uh, dealt with these the vaccine patents for however many years. So one of the things that we asked was, what in the name of all that is holy is the United States of America as a government doing, funding, researching, and patenting the development of dangerous and new man-made viruses? Wouldn't that be a bad idea? Wouldn't you think you're it? I don't care about the can we remember we, we've said this before and it wasn't me who came up with this. It's it's not. Can we do it? It's should we do this or just because you can doesn't mean you should. Now, the United States of America, and I know this is a fact uh, going all the way back to World War One and then post-World War II, and then during the Cold War, we're the signatory to numerous treaties saying that chemical and biological warfare is a, uh, what do you call it? Um, what do they call it? A, a uh, crime against humanity. Yes. And that we would not engage in it, Right. Chemical and biological warfare is a crime against humanity, right? It's weapons of mass destruction. And we signed treaties with allies saying that we wouldn't do that. And we're like, yeah, that's right. That was one of the reasons that during Desert Storm, after Saddam Hussein's, uh, Saddam Hussein had eight years of fighting against Iran before we got there. And I know you guys don't have memories and you were completely um, failed by the public education system. But Saddam Hussein used gas, all kinds of different gases, sarin gas, nerve agents, and, and so forth um, against the Iranians. Primarily, it was artillery shells, some rockets, but uh, he gassed the crap out of them. And the UN condemned him. They did con, you know, resolutions condemning his behavior, blah, 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 blah. And then when the, the Kurds in northern Iraq were acting up and they wanted independence, he gassed the crap out of them, too. He used chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction against his own people, against you know ethnic Iraqis or whatever, Iraqi citizens, the Kurds. And every time, you know, it happened in World War One, and then, you know, see, the Germans gassed people in World War One. They're like, hey, check out this new crap we came up with. Uh, and then going into World War Two, we had signed treaties saying that that was a crime against humanity, right? So knowing all this, why in the F-bomb is the United States government funding the development of viruses, of man-made viruses? Now, I can see funding the curing or the, the, of existing viruses, but why in a sane world, in a world that's supposedly sane, would you say, would anyone agree, you, you know what we need to do? We need to take existing viruses and make them more contagious. 
what? Yeah, we need to take the existing viruses that we have, the natural ones, the ones that like occurred in nature, and we need to engineer them and come up with something that's even more contagious. And nobody, no one stood up and said, no, you're a lunatic and need to go to prison for having that idea. That's no. And not only that, but having developed a man-made contagion, then putting a patent on it, going to the, the patent office of the United States and saying, hey, this is we want to patent this virus that we created. Like, you do want a what? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't want anybody else to be able to do it. We want 100% control over this virus that we created. And somebody said, um, isn't that uh, by developing biological weapons, isn't that a crime against humanity? Didn't the United States of America sign treaties condemning that? Well, yeah, so. But that was a long time ago. So we signed treaties saying we wouldn't do that, so. So that is my lead up to this video. So David Martin was invited in front of the European Union Parliament in Brussels to speak on, well, the creation of COVID, SARS, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Listen, and we've been trying to share this, and socialist media, being the criminals that they are, have been, have been hiding it. But we're not going to hide it, and we're not going to be censored, and we're not going to allow big tech and scumbags like Zuckerberg and, and his ilk to hide this. Because we have evidence. First of all, we know because sane people who aren't driven by fear know and understand that what occurred in the year 2020 was not an accident. It wasn't unpredictable. As a matter of fact, it was the exact opposite. It was orchestrated deliberately and purposefully. So listen to... Uh, David Martin, we're not going to play it like beginning to end without breaking, but listen to this. Wait, before we start, I just, I want, I, there, the internet does not have much information on this gentleman or this event, which it immediately makes me think like, hey, we should really push this in front of people as fast as we can. Because if there's not a lot of information, um, then that seems to be what happens when the the truth is trying to be suppressed. Um, but what I want from you guys, the listeners, is this in this video, you'll see that he's actually referencing a PowerPoint or a presentation of some sort. I have scoured the Internet trying to look for this thing because he, he says in the beginning, he's like, hey, look at, you know, go check the references. It's like, that's awesome. I would love those references to have in front of me so that it's just a more stacking of truth on top of all the other truth that already exists. I haven't been able to find it. So if one of you guys is an internet expert, that would be amazing if you could send that to uh, my email address, J A R R A D at student of the gun.com. All right. I'll shut my mouth and let uh, D Martin talk. Set, we're setting up the microphones. It is a, there you go. it is a particularly interesting location for me to be sitting today, given that, over a decade ago, I sat in this very chair right here in the European Union Parliament. And at that time, I warned the world of what was coming. Uh, during that conversation that was hosted at the time by the Green and EFA and a number of the other parties of the European Union's uh, various representations, we were having a conversation on whether Europe should adopt the United States policy of allowing for the patents on biologically derived materials. And at the time, I urged this body and I urged people around the world that the weaponization of nature against humanity had dire consequences. Tragically, I sit here today 
um, with that unfortunate line that I don't like to say, which I told you so. But the fact of the matter is we're here not for a reprisal on past decisions. We're here to actually once again come to the face of the human condition and ask the question, who do we want to be? What do we want humanity to look like? And rather than seeing this as an exercise in futility, which is very easy from time to time when you're in the position I'm in, I actually see this not as an exercise in futility. I see this as one of the greatest opportunities that faces us because we now have a public conversation, which is now front and center in people's minds. When this was an esoteric conversation about biological patents, nobody cared. But when that conversation came home, then it became something people can care about. So I'm actually quite grateful for this opportunity. I thank the members of parliament for hosting this. I thank all of the translators who I apologize in advance. I will use terminology that is probably very difficult to translate. So my apologies. And I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that many of you are aware of my involvement with this in large part due to the amazing work of my wonderful wife, Kim Martin, who encouraged me at the very early days of this pandemic to get on front of the camera and talk about all the information that I had been sharing among very small groups around the world. And it was in fact her encouragement that put me in a place where many of you have heard what I have to say. Ironically, the world that I came from that used to be very popular, my CNBC and Bloomberg presentations, which were televised on mainstream media around the world, was an audience that I lost. I, I can confidently say COVID diminished my fame. But I can also confidently say that I'd rather stand among the people with whom I'm standing today than any of the folks that were part of that previous world. So this is a much better place to be. Ahead, My role today is to set the stage for this conversation. All right, let's talk about that real quick. This guy is what, what we need to ask ourselves is why in the year 2020, every quote unquote American news outlet agency, if they're investigative journalists, if they're seeking the truth, if their goal when the this 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 mystery virus. We have no idea what it is. We don't know where it came from. It's just uh, we think it came from a wet market in Wuhan because some dudes were eating bat soup and they got sick. Undercooked bat soup. <clears throat> why weren't CNN, MSNBC? Why why wasn't the mainstream news in the United States of America? Why didn't they seek this dude out? You mean why didn't they partake in investigative journalism? Yeah, why why in why were they not investigating? And so today when you turn on whatever the fuck it is. Oops, sorry. We're still on the When you turn on whatever it is and they want to tell you CNN wants to tell you, MSN wants to tell you ABC, CBS, whatever. They want to tell you, derp, derp, right? And like, you need to believe this. Why? Why, ABC? Why, New York Times? Why should I believe you? When you engaged in lies by omission, this guy, it, there's, there's documentation that he was before the sat before the European Union Parliament when they were talking about patenting viruses and how it was a bad idea for them to follow the United States model of patenting man-made viruses. So what we know from the outset is that we weren't being given all of the information that was available when they say oh come on paul you can't be mad at the you can't be mad at them they were doing the best they could with what was available no they weren't they were engaging and behaving as a propaganda organ for the state who had decided that we're going to have a pandemic 
We're going to have fear. We're going to have a pandemic. And we're going to run the narrative, the lie, that we have no idea what this is. But don't worry. We're on it. We're going to do the best we can with the information that we have. I saw a picture yesterday, and it was a toy aisle in a store. I don't know if it was Walmart or Target, but it had tape. They had taken the, the, that, that, you know, the, the not evidence, like the not crime scene, but kind of like a, a, that block off stuff and uh, blocked off the section. And they had the, the hand thing. They're like the no. And it was a picture of a toy section in a store. And the May May says, do you remember when we were told that we could stop a virus by keeping preventing kids from buying toys? You're like, no, that wasn't it. No, no. Remember when stores had to not, were ordered to not sell you things because they were, quote, not essential? Do you remember in the state of Michigan where they ordered the seed areas of Walmart to be blocked off? I remember that. Where you couldn't, you were not allowed to go into a Walmart in the spring of 2020 in Michigan and buy seeds. Because why? Because the, the, the tyrant of Michigan had decided it, that it was not essential. The witch that sits in Lansing decided that the peasants didn't need vegetable seeds. It was not essential. And she decided that she had the authority... Because there's a panic. There's a pandemic. Now I have the authority to decide what people can and can't have. And how do they get that authority? Well, you know, technically, she's got as much authority as people will let her have. How do they convince people to go along with that? The media. The American media and the American big tech media worked in consort to hide real information can, can we continue playing this let's continue video? i think yes. we might have enough time to get through the whole thing yeah go conversation in a historical context because this did not come in the last three years this did not come in the last five or six years this actually is an ongoing question that probably began here in europe in the early stages of the mid 1900s but certainly by 1913, 1914, this conversation started right here in Central Europe. The pandemic that we alleged to have happen in the last few years also did not happen overnight. In fact, the very specific pandemic using coronavirus began in a very different time. And we'll try to advance the slides here with one of these things. Oh, there we go. Most of you don't know that coronavirus as a model of a pathogen was isolated in 1965. Coronavirus was identified in 1965 as one of the first infectious replicatable viral models that could be used to modify a series of other experiences of the human condition. It was isolated once upon a time associated with the common cold. But what's particularly interesting about its isolation in 1965 was that it was immediately identified as a pathogen that could be used and modified for a whole host of reasons. And you heard me correctly, that was 1965. And by the way, these slides are public domain. You're welcome to look at every single reference. Every comment that I made is based on published material. So do make sure that you look at those references. But in 1966, the very first COV coronavirus model was used as a transatlantic biological experiment in human manipulation. And you heard the date. 1966. CNN I hope you're getting the point of what info. I'm saying. This is not an overnight thing. This is actually something that's been long in the making. 
A year before I was born, we had the first transatlantic coronavirus data sharing experiment between the United States and the United Kingdom. And in 1967, the year I was born, we did the first human trials on inoculating people with modified coronavirus. Listen, is that amazing? 56 years ago, the overnight success of a pathogen that's been 56 years in engineering. And I want that to chill with all of you. Where were we when we actually allowed, in violation of biological and chemical weapons treaties, where were we as a human civilization when we thought it was an acceptable thing to do to take a pathogen for the United States and infect the world with it? Where was that conversation? And what should have been that conversation in 1967? That conversation wasn't had. Ironically, the common cold was turned into a chimera in the 1970s. And in 1975, 1976, and 1977, we started figuring out how to modify coronavirus by putting it into different animals, pigs and dogs. And not surprisingly, by the time we got to 1990, we found out that coronavirus as a infectious agent was an industrial problem for two primary industries, the industries of dogs and pigs. Dog breeders and pigs found that coronavirus created gastrointestinal problems, and that became the basis for Pfizer's first spike protein vaccine patent filed, are you ready for this, in 1990. All right, stop right there. Here we okay. You're telling me that when the coronavirus, when the Rona, when it showed up on the shores of the United States of America in early 2020, that not one person at the New York Times, not one person at NBC, Washington Post, not one person, not one investigative journalist could find out, discover that the coronavirus as a pathogen had been identified in 1965. Not one person could find out, could discover that not only had it not been was it identified, that, that the United States of America had been genetically modifying coronavirus and deliberately doing biological warfare experimentation. And did you hear what he just said? He said that the Pfizer... The miracle company, the company that works so hard, Operation Warp Speed. We got a virus. We don't know what it is. We don't know where it came from. But boy, we're going to go to work right now trying to solve this problem. We're going to come up with a vaccine in record time. Somebody who looks a lot like this guy sitting right here said there's no way in God's green earth that they developed a quote cure vaccine for a virus that they didn't even know what it was six months ago because that's not how that works that's not how it's ever worked in the history of mankind it has never worked like that no Pfizer started working on a quote vaccine for the coronavirus in 1990, 1990, 33 years ago. Where's CNN? Where's the New York Times? Where's the New York Post? Why, hasn't, why wasn't all of this information, which was public record, why was it hidden from the people of the United States and the world. Zach, go ahead and play. Did you hear what I just said? 1990, Operation Warp Speed? I'm sorry. Where's the warp and the speed? Pfizer, 1990, the very first spike protein vaccine for coronavirus. 
Isn't that fascinating? Isn't it fascinating that we were, we were told that, well, the spike protein is a new thing. We just found out that that's the problem. No. As a matter of fact, we didn't just find out it was not just now, now the problem. We found that out in 1990 and filed the first patents on vaccines in 1990 for the spike protein of coronavirus. And who would have thought? Pfizer. Clearly the innocent organization that does nothing but promote human health. Clearly Pfizer. The organization that has not bought the votes in this chamber and in every chamber of every government around the world. Not that Pfizer. Certainly they wouldn't have had anything to do with this. But oh yes, they did. And in 1990, they found out that there was a problem with vaccines. They didn't work. You know why they didn't work? It turns out that coronavirus is a very malleable model. It transforms and it changes and it mutates over time. As a matter of fact, every publication on vaccines for coronavirus from 1990 until 2018, every single publication concluded that coronavirus escapes the vaccine impulse because it modifies and mutates too quickly for vaccines to be effective. And since 1990 to 2018, that is the published science, ladies and gentlemen. That's following the science. Following the science is their own indictment of their own programs that said it doesn't work. Go ahead, pause. And there are thousands of publications to that. Do we have, Zachary, the, do you have archived the video of all of the world leaders saying, take the shot, you won't get sick? Uh, take the shot and you won't get it? Solid maybe. I know that that's one of the okay, things. Okay, we'll, we'll put that in. We'll put it in tomorrow. But I want you guys to remember that. Never, ever, ever, ever forget that it, wasn't, it was just, wasn't just a meat puppet. It, the meat puppet was one of them. That the world leaders, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom, America, supposedly the free world, supposedly the good guys, every single one of them went to cameras, stood in front of podiums, and lied directly to the people. They knew. Since 1990, they knew that there is no viable vaccine for a coronavirus because they made the virus. They created it. It wasn't a bunch of bats and penguins fornicating in a soup bowl, okay? They made it. They knew what it was. And they knew 30 years ago that they could not create a vaccine for this monster that they created. And yet, in the year 2021, they looked you in the eye and said, just get the shot. Go ahead and play. In fact, not a few hundred. And not paid for by pharmaceutical companies. These are publications that are independent scientific research that shows unequivocally, including efforts of the chimera modifications made by Ralph Barrick in the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. All of them show vaccines do not work on coronavirus. That's the science. And that science has never been disputed. But then we had an interesting development in 2002. And this date is most important. Because in 2002, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, patented, and I quote, an infectious replication defective clone of coronavirus. Listen to those words, infectious replication defective. What does that phrase actually mean? For those of you not familiar with language, let me unpack it for you. Infectious replication defective means a weapon. It means something meant to target an individual, but not have collateral damage to other individuals. That's what infectious replication defective means. 
And that patent was filed in 2002 on work funded by NIAID's Anthony Fauci from 1999 to 2002. And that work patented at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, mysteriously preceded SARS 1.0 by a year. (gasps) Dave, are you suggesting that SARS 1.0 wasn't from a wet market in Wuhan? Are you suggesting it might have come from a laboratory? In the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill? No, I'm not suggesting it. I'm telling you that's the facts. We engineered SARS. SARS is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. The naturally occurring phenomenon is called the common cold. It's called influenza-like illness. It's called gastroenteritis. That's the naturally occurring coronavirus. SARS is is the research developed by humans weaponizing a life system model to actually attack human beings. And they patented it in 2002. And in 2003, giant surprise, the CDC filed the patent on coronavirus isolated from humans in violation, once again, of biological and chemical weapons treaties and laws that we have in the United States. And I'm very, very precise on this. The United States likes to talk about its rights and everything else and the rule of law and all the nonsense that we like to talk about. But we don't ratify treaties about, I don't know, defending humans. We conspicuously avoid that. We actually have a great track record of advocating for human rights and then denying them when it comes to actually being part of the international community, which is a slightly problematic thing. But let's get something very clear. When the CDC in April of 2003 filed the patent on SARS coronavirus isolated from humans, what did they do? They downloaded a sequence from China and filed a patent on it in the United States. Any of you familiar with biological and chemical weapons treaties knows that's a violation. That's a crime. That's not an innocent oops. That's a crime. And the United States Patent Office went as far as to reject that patent application on two occasions until the CDC decided to bribe the Patent Office to override the patent examiner to ultimately issue the patent in 2007 on SARS coronavirus. But let's not let that get away from us because it turns out that the RT-PCR which was the test that we allegedly were going to use to identify the risks associated with coronavirus, was actually identified as a bioterrorism threat by me in the European Union sponsored events in 2002 and 2003, 20 years ago. That happened here in Brussels and across Europe. In 2005, This particular pathogen was specifically labeled as a bioterrorism and bioweapon platform technology. Described as such, that's not my terminology that I'm applying to it. It was actually described as a bioweapons platform technology in 2005. And from 2005 onwards, it was actually a biowarfare enabling agent. It's official classification from 2005 forward. I don't know if that sounds like public health to you. Does it? Biological warfare enabling technology. That feels like not public health. That feels like not medicine. That feels like a weapon designed to take out humanity. That's what it feels like. And it feels like that because that's exactly what it is. We have been lured into believing that EcoHealth Alliance and DARPA and all of these organizations are what we should be pointing to. But we've been specifically requested to ignore the facts that over $10 billion have been funneled through black operations through the check of Anthony Fauci and a side by side ledger where NIAID has a balance sheet and next to it is a biodefense balance sheet equivalent dollar for dollar matching that no one in the media talks about. And it's been going on since 2005. Our gain of function moratorium the moratorium that was supposed to freeze any efforts to do gain-of-function research. Conveniently, in the fall of 2014, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill received a letter from NIAID saying that while the gain-of-function moratorium on coronavirus in vivo should be suspended, because their grants had already been funded, they received an exemption. 
Did you hear what I just said? A biological weapons lab facility at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, received an exemption from the gain of function moratorium so that by 2016, we could publish the, the journal article that said SARS coronavirus is poised for human emergence in 2016. And what, you might ask, Dave, was the coronavirus poised for human emergence? It was W. I V one Wuhan Institute of Virology virus one poised for human emergence in 2016 at the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, such that by the time we get to 2017 and 2018, the following phrase entered into common parlance among the community there is going to be an accidental or intentional release of a respiratory pathogen. The operative word, obviously, in that phrase, the word release. Does that sound like leak? Does that sound like a bat and a pangolin went into a bar in the Wuhan market and hung out and had sex, and, and lo and behold, we got SARS-CoV-2? No. Accidental or intentional release of a respiratory pathogen was the terminology used. And four times in April of 2019, seven months before the allegation of patient number one, four patent applications of Moderna were modified to include the term accidental or intentional release of a respiratory pathogen as the justification for making a vaccine for a thing that did not exist. Keep going. If you have not done so, please make sure that you make reference in every investigation to the premeditation nature of this, because it was in September of 2019 that the world was informed that we were going to have an accidental or intentional release of a respiratory pathogen so that by September 2020, there would be a worldwide acceptance of a universal vaccine template. That's their words right in front of you on the screen. The intent was to get the world to accept a universal vaccine template, and the intent was to use coronavirus to get there. And the last slide. Right. Last slide. This isn't advancing, so if I could have somebody do it. Let's, let's read this, because we have to read this into the record everywhere I go. Until an infectious disease crisis is very real, present, and at the emergency threshold, it is often largely ignored. To sustain the funding base beyond the crisis, he said, we need to increase the public understanding for the need for medical countermeasures such as a pan-influenza or pan-coronavirus vaccine. A key driver is the media, and the economics will follow the hype. We need to use that hype to our advantage to get to the real issues. Investors will respond if they see profit at the end of the process. Sounds like public health? Sounds like the best of humanity. No, ladies and gentlemen, this was premeditated domestic terrorism stated at the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015, published in front of them. This is an this is an act of biological and chemical warfare perpetrated on the human race. And it was admitted to in writing that this was a financial heist and a financial fraud. Investors will follow if they see profit at the end of the process. Let me All conclude right, by making it. five very brief recommendations. Okay. You want to do the five brief recommendations? Uh, I think how far in are we, Zach? We've come this we, far. We've only got about two. We have about a minute and a half left. Oh, okay. Yeah. We've, yeah, we've come this far. Go ahead. Listen up, people. The last slide. Nature was hijacked. This whole story started in 1965 when we decided to hijack a natural model and decide to start manipulating it. Science was hijacked when the only questions that could be asked were questions authorized under the patent protection of the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, and their equivalent organizations around the world. We didn't have independent science. We had hijacked science. And unfortunately, there was no moral oversight in violation of all of the codes that we stand for. There was no independent, financially disinterested, independent review board ever impaneled around coronavirus, not once. Not once, not since 1965. 
We do not have a single independent IRB ever impaneled around coronavirus. So morality was suspended for medical countermeasures. And ultimately, humanity was lost because we decided to allow it to happen. Our job today is to say no more gain of function research, period. No more weaponization of nature, period. And most importantly, no more corporate patronage of science for their own self-interest unless they assume 100 percent product liability for every injury and every death that they maintain. Thank you very much. All right. So that's it. There's a lot I could say, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to step on that. Uh, Robert Malone was right. Peter McCullough was right. The people who were silenced and mocked and threatened into silence were right. We weren't threatened or silenced uh, or mocked. Well, people mocked us, but um, the entire time we knew this was a lie. We knew it was fraud. We knew it was instrument. It was it was created. It was perpetrated deliberately. There was no possible way it could have been an accident. We were right the whole time. The question you need to ask is: All right, now we have this information. A why is the American media hiding this? The Europeans, to their credit, actually brought him out publicly and exposed the truth publicly in Europe. Where's the American well, it, media? It's not surprising because it was the ECR. If you saw that banner behind him, and the ECR is the conservative and reformist group in the European Union. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like our, our conservative group in, um, in America, which is, is kind of sad. Because you think that everybody would want to listen to this information because it. (laughs) No, they don't because it it allowed them to take control over your life. It allowed them to take control over your business, your money. It gave them more control than they'd ever had in their history of the world. And they're not just going to give that up. They're not just going to let that go. All right, on Thursday, Student of the Gun University podcast, we're going to talk about the value of team training. Tomorrow, you can be strong and healthy and protect your kids. Yes, you can. And we're going to do a little bit of follow-up. So if you'd like to join us for the grad program, I'd love for you to be there. You go to getsotg.com, sign up and be there. And uh, we'll have more for you tomorrow. But until then, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being out there. Spread the word. All of the links are in the show notes. All the information is there. You just have to have the courage to face it, to see it, to read it, to understand it, and accept it. Until we're together again, remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.